most people never get a chance to see things like a dark sky. Uh, you know, something that everybody had 150 years ago uh, is something that almost no one has anymore. McDonald Observatory is unique because the sky here is the darkest of any observatory in the United States. If you come out here on a night like tonight where there's no moon and you look up there at the sky, you can't see the constellations because there are so many stars out here. This location was chosen for the observatory for actually several different reasons. Uh, one is the, the dry climate means that we have a lot of clear nights to do our viewing. Uh, that's obviously important. You go building in some place like Houston or Galveston, uh, you're just not going to get a chance to use your telescopes very often. The uh, altitude of the mountains here as well means that you don't have to look through as much stuff. Uh, basically, we live at the bottom of an ocean of air, and the more of that you have to look through, the less clearly you're going to be able to see things. So we're at 7,000 feet here. That means we get a much better view than you get from sea level. The fact that we don't have any big towns and cities out here means that we have uh, some of the darkest skies in the continental United States. That's obviously very important because many of the objects we look at are very faint. The McDonald Observatory telescope facilities are located in West Texas, about 450 miles from Austin. We're in the middle of Jeff Davis County and the Davis Mountains. And living here is, a, is an interesting experience. Uh, we're, we're, we're nowhere near a Walmart or, uh, or a Target. Uh, we stock up. We have freezers and a couple of extra refrigerators if we need them. Uh, the power is sometimes goes out a little bit. All of the actual telescope research facilities of the observatory are located here while the administrative offices and the research offices themselves are located in Austin on the UT campus. We're currently facilitating a workshop for elementary school teachers. And this particular workshop was made possible by NASA Texas Space Grant Consortium for teachers in rural Texas. So we have 15 teachers right now, and we've been spending time with them sharing how students can explore astronomy in the classroom. I've said this with every single school group, is to ask the simplest question you can while you're here at the observatory, because those questions are the hardest to answer. I'm going to say a word, and I want to know what you're thinking. What's the first word in your mind when you hear this? Nature. Trees and animals. Grace, trees and animals, please. Evergreens and sky. Earth. Trees. There. Bugs. Plants. Animal plants. All right. Did you notice something? No one said anything astronomical. Oh. Uh -oh. That's <laughs> astronomical. So let's do it again. <laughs> In addition to the fact that just our, our visitation was such that we had outgrown our old facility, part of the reason we built the new visitor center was to be able to offer teacher workshops. Uh, that was one of the reasons we built the new visitor center with a classroom. What we hope that teachers will take with them to explain to students astronomy in terms of it being part of nature, all of nature, everything we see in the night sky is a part of nature, as much as trees and flowers and animals and us. So we hope to present these activities in a way that makes their enthusiasm contagious to the students. Uh, there was a young man, he was nine, his name was Nathan. This wasn't a school trip, but he was just here with his family. And I asked a question to a hundred people, what does a paleontologist collect and study? And Nathan put his hand up, dinosaur bones, he said. And then I said, well, all right, Nathan, well, what does a paleontologist collect dinosaur bones in? He had shorts, cowboy boots, and his socks pulled all the way up to me, and a bandana on. And he said, he did his thumb like this, and he said, back of the truck. And I asked, where are you from? And he said, I'm from Big Spring, Texas. Right? What about an entomologist? What does an entomologist collect? In a what? Jar. In a jar or bag, right? Uh, ichthyology. Fish. Fish. Excellent. What does an ichthyologist collect fish in? Water. Right. <laughs> now tell me, what does an astronomer collect and study? Data. This is all nature. What does an astronomer collect and study? Pictures. Stars. That's a common answer. Right? So you're what? saying they really don't collect stars? No. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> what do astronomers collect? Light. Ah, Hector did it. Mm. We can study stars without having to go there by collecting light. What do astronomers collect light in? Yes. Now you're where I want you to be. Ever since I was a tiny little kid, I, I've been fascinated by the universe. Uh, I saw a star moving when I was about two or three, and one of my earliest words was satellite, which means satellite in Spanish. About eighth or ninth grade, we, uh, 
bought my dad a telescope for Christmas, and I used it to look at the planets and got interested in them. And then when I left home, I took it, took his telescope with me, and finally gave it back to him just a couple of months ago. <laughs> when when I'm excited about teaching, the kids always get excited about learning. If it's something you don't enjoy, they're probably not going to either. Well, I've always been interested in astronomy. I've always looked up at the skies and been very curious. What I really liked about this uh, experience was meeting the uh, astronomers here. They're all so uh, knowledgeable and enthusiastic and just very contagious. Modern astronomy is completely done with computers, and so you don't see any eyepiece. What you see is a doer that holds a CCD instead of... Uh, the old romantic way of the, the comic strips of being out here in, in the cold, freezing night. We're in a nice, warm control room typing away at a computer. A lot of people are disappointed when they find out that we, we don't actually look through the telescope. After all, we have the instruments which are much better at looking through the telescope than we are. Uh, we have not only, of course, the, the guided tours and solar viewings and the star parties, we also do special viewing night programs on our research telescopes. This gives people a chance to actually look through some of these very large telescopes that we have here. This is something that's not done at very many observatories. In fact, the 107 inch is the largest telescope that is open to the public to, to actually look through. Well, of course, you all teach your children in the schools that the planets in our solar system move around the sun. And how many of you have had some child raise her hand and ask, how does the sun know it's supposed to stand still? Well. The point is, that kid was onto something. The sun is making this very tiny reflex orbit due to the presence of all the planets in our solar system. You know, Jupiter is making this uh, giant orbit that's out 5.2 times the Earth's distance from the sun. So the sun is making an orbit a thousand times smaller. So what's happening is the sun is moving back and forth in the sky by about its own size, once every 12 years, because of Jupiter. So we have a list of about two or three hundred stars, and then over time we will look at how the speed of each star is changing to see if that is revealing the presence of a planet there. The thing, of course, that we're always trying to do is find an Earth-like planet, and not just a planet the size of the Earth, but at the same distance from the star as the Earth is, so that water can be in a liquid state. And if you have water on a, in a liquid state on an Earth-like planet, you have the possibility for life to develop. Since I am a novice when it comes to the subject of astronomy, the Star Challenger activity was one that was really interesting because it gave you a guide. Okay, well, when I was doing this inside, you, know, you already knew where to position and where was what, and then you were able to guide yourself around. Teachers, including me, feel intimidated by this. And even though the kids love it, we're just so intimidated because we don't understand it. We just skip through it. The McDonald Observatory is giving us the opportunity to have a greater understanding. I concur. I plan to share with friends at other campuses, and if I had the opportunity to talk to other schools and other towns, I would tell them to come, drop everything they can, and come. Teachers need to experience this to have that childlike wonder that the kids have. On a good day in my classroom, when I'm the effective teacher that I've been trained to be, I can infect the children with my lifelong love of learning. And when a teacher does that, a teacher's effective. That's why I come to these workshops, because my education cannot be static. I have to stay ahead of my kids, and I have to stay ahead of the curve. There are a lot of activities that the students will benefit from, and as they say, who knows, maybe these students that we are going to teach could be the future astronomers. A lot of our kids don't have you know, role models to lead them. They don't feel confident, they don't have the self-esteem to leave town and, and try great careers. So I think just to inspire them, not just to learn about the universe, but to maybe, you know, make it into a career. People have been questioning the things that they see in the night sky for, well, as long as there have been people. I think it's just a natural question, what is all this stuff? How does it relate to us? And so it's through the science of astronomy that we really come to understand so much more about where we are in the universe, what our place is in the universe, and how all this stuff came about. The best part of being a professional astronomer is I get paid for doing my hobby. You can't get under a dark sky. You can't see this, this, this ribbon of light that we call the Milky Way and not be just in awe of it. It begs explanation. 
we have to probe at least a few mysteries of the universe to continue to be human. Uh, humans are explorers. We've always been explorers. And so this is just a natural aspect of that.